see, now you and Robert, I guess, are the only two people left in the wax from the old <coughs> congregation. And you still got the building. But I hear you're ready to be my <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't blame you. It's been a good building to serve its purpose. The only church I know dedicated that uh, really stood the test of time, that uh, the Lord's word would really go forth in it, because I think it's the only church in all the message that uh, is an old church that uh, sort of took the message and did and, and came right into where we stand today. And the Brother Brand is close to me. <coughs> family from Louisville, and it's nice to see you all trust you all doing very, very well. Now, Wednesday, of course, at 7.30, we're continuing with our studies in the future on the earthly bride, and then, of course, by Sunday again, and uh, as we've already been told, hopefully, we'll get in the other building, and uh, we like the idea you have enough air to cool you or to freeze you, enough heat to warm you, to toast you, out, pretty big outfits, and everything should be quite propitious for you. Now, uh, because we take <coughs> a certain uh, line of thought, uh, like we're doing now with the future home, <coughs> and uh, putting our minds to it more than anything else, and we have had other studies in the past, and we've tried to adapt them to the pastoral attitude and understanding. Now, I'll take a few minutes this morning, and I'll just cut back on the other message. Uh, concerning what is before us in the sense of uh, what is really holding up the church? How far are we? Uh, where are we <coughs> in the economy of God at this particular time uh, as to the going away of the bride following the resurrection? Uh, which resurrection cannot come forth until the bride is in a position to see it, and also cannot come forth until everything that is evil is thoroughly manifested. Now, <clears throat> you notice that Timothy, that's Paul Ray, and Peter used the same words concerning perilous times. And in 2 Timothy 3, Paul says, Know this also, that in the last days perilous times shall come, and the peril is going to be in the society of the church, the church society, where men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disney parents, unfamily, holy. Now, someone might say, well, this is the world. I beg to differ. This is the church, because God doesn't give much of a comment on the world. The world is described in Romans 1 and in other portions of Scripture. And this is what is committed to the church, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accused, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good. And you see the church rising up very ahead of the lead marchers and everything else, the Lutherans and the, uh, and the uh, Anglicans are worse than the Catholics, but I think you'll find a lot of Catholics are instigating it. They're the instigators behind it. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God having a form of goddess and denying the power of them from such turn away. And you can see right there, this is to the church. For of this sort of aid, so and so and so and so. Coming down the line, you see Janus and Jambers manifested. And then down to 10, it says, but thou hast fully known my doctrine. You know, Paul put that ahead of everything. What good is any conduct without the right doctrine? What good is anything? What, what's spouting this message verbatim? What does it do if you don't know what you're talking about? And the stupidest thing in the world is to try to teach the Bible you don't know the doctrine. You can't, you can't do it. See? And he said, You know my long suffering, my love, my patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came in Antioch, and Lister, but and the persecutions I endured but of, of them all the Lord drew me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. <clears throat> now let's just hold our fingers and get back to, to Peter. And I think it's second Peter chapter one. And the first chapter there in verse 4, it says uh, <coughs> these great and precious promises given to us, uh, being partakers of the divine nature, and we'll see that in this message this morning, I think we might get that far in the divine nature. Having escaped the corrupt in the world of us, and besides the giving all the others, add your faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge, God, temper, temper, patience, and the patience, godliness, and God's brotherly kindness. Now you notice that godliness comes just before brotherly kindness, which we're in now, which will lead us, of course, 
through God himself being enthroned in our hearts and lives as God is enthroned over the church because he had the church having come down. The camp throne spiritually is here. <clears throat> so what I'm looking at here is the two major the two major propositions at the end time are godliness and brotherly kindness. And you say, yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now these up here are not living godly. So there's got to be a group of people living godly, and because of it they will suffer persecution. And that persecution will drive the people together in brotherly kindness. More and more and more. And Brother Branham warned us to stay in that position of being, you know, full of love and continuing in what he had taught us. <clears throat> but evil men shall, shall wax, and evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and have been assured by vindication. Now anybody can talk, so what I assure you, my friend, this is right. I wouldn't give you a nickel for that. Marriage vows or anything else. Or the government pledging hall. I've got time for that nonsense. I want something that's not just written out, I want something that there's something behind it. I don't care where you turn today, you can't find anything behind it in the government or any place else. The legal courts, there's no way you can, I'm sorry, <coughs> but that doesn't mean you take the law in your hands or anything else or go another direction. It just means don't look for it, kid, you're stuck. Let's understand it because we're not babies anymore. See? You've got no assurance anyway. The only assurance you've got is a vindicated message, and that's all you have got. And you can't prove that. In other words, I'm trying to tell you, you are walking by faith, period. Faith doesn't have a thing to do with sight. Amen. Amen. Now, we've seen plenty. God's been good to us, giving the grace of visibility. But I tell you, you can't prove a thing. The only time anything will be proven is when we see William Brown come back on this earth in the resurrection. Then you know he made it what he said was true. In the meantime, we believe it's right. Now, if we're right, everything else is going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. <clears throat> All right, let's go to Second Peter, maybe somewhere here. Third Peter, Second Peter three. Now they said the scoffers are going to appear. In verse four, they're going to say, "Where is the promise coming?" And now, where is it? Where? What is all this presence? What? What does it come to? It's come to my faith. I am assured that I am bright. I'm sure that I'm going to make it. I'm sure that I have been judged. I'm sure White Throne is going on now. For all intents and purposes. I'm positively assured by vindication. <clears throat> no problem. See, they don't understand what Brother Branham taught. Majority of them. They haven't got a clue. Most churches don't. Now, if our groups of people haven't got a clue hardly what Brother Branham taught, and remember, I expect by first-hand experience, by the time Brother Branham died, there was only one book that had any hint of what Brother Branham spoke of. That was the church ages. You can say what you want, and I'm not boasting. I'm telling you the truth. Because I talked about things with him that were absolutely Greek to everybody else. They were Greek to me. Not understanding what he's saying. <clears throat> so... They say, where, 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 where is this business of the present? I want to ask you this morning, what does the presence of God mean to you in assurance? And what is going on in your part? Now, this is not a homiletic address. This is a straight question to people here. It's not rhetorical. It's not a rhetorical question. It demands an answer from your heart. Where do you stand in relationship to? What does it mean? What's it, what's it all about? If you've ever seen Brother Brandon, you'd know what I'm talking about. I just mean it hasn't reached me. It never reached me like it reached him. But the awe and the sincerity and the depth of that in that man's heart was something that was notable. And I was very privy to it. I don't know what I'm talking about. Now, where is it now? Since the father's fell asleep, <coughs> William Branham gone, <coughs> was it just something happens every 2,000 years? What's going on? What happened? No. We well, you know what's going on. Now watch. All things were at the beginning. For they are willfully ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were bold, and the earth standing out of the water, and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished, but the heaven and earth which now are, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire, against the day of judgment and perdition of godly men. <clears throat> now it tells you right here. In our Bible open before us, we know what God said. There's two things holding the whole program up. 
Number one, man has not gone far enough into <coughs> sin. Number two, the earth is not sufficiently defiled. You say, when will it be? I don't know, but it's getting that way pretty fast. <coughs> the two go together. <coughs> the two go together. The complete defiling of the church, of humanity, and of the world itself, nature. And pretty soon, with the splicing of the genes, they're turning loose upon nature now, things that they cannot control because they will mutate. Let's say the two harmful things come together, <coughs> like sodium chloride. That's salt, isn't it? Just pure salt, sodium chloride. Sodium chloride. Mm -hmm. All right. Individually, they're murdered. <coughs> Combined, too much, also murdered. Just the right amount from the right place. Very tasty. Very good. Let us say we combine combine two things, splice two things that themselves are very dangerous and they seem okay in nature. Who said they can't revert? Let's say there are two things that are very good by themselves combined, and they can cause an explosion, as many, many things do. <coughs> we know that for a fact. All right, that can happen. So we see nature's on the verge of being destroyed. Let me bring you to the church now. We're talking of the church in the sense of evil men, seducers, waxing worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, but continue thou on the things you've learned and have been assured of knowing from whom thou, of whom thou hast learned them and from a child that's known the Holy Scripture. So in other words, this boy is very astute. He knows what he sees. He brings it to the Scripture. He understands it. <clears throat> now, let me see where the church is. We're going to judge it from the brand of message. And from the brand of message, I mean those that are interested in this message and say, well, we belong to the message. So let's read from the book of Isaiah, <coughs> chapter 40. <coughs> you take verse 6. The voice said, cry, and he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is as grass, is grass. And all the goodness thereof is of the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. Because the Spirit of the Lord blows upon us, surely the people is grass. And are we getting ready for, for the grass to be burned up? The grass withers, the flower fades. In other words, there'll be no more generations. It's all gone, root branch and so on. But the word of our God shall stand forever. Now what do you want with you when the chips are down? You want the word of God or don't you want the word of God? See, and that's what we're looking at. This is why this church stands for one thing, only the word of God, because we there ain't got it. And there's nobody sitting in this church here got it. And there's nobody I know that's got it. I don't care who you say or what you say. You ain't got it. It's the word that's got it. Amen. And if happily you should be the begging ground of the word, you're in business. See? Now that's what we believe here. Brother Brana said so. So I'm speaking from the mouth of the prophet. He used a different language. He, see, ta he talked about God's husband, which is the earth. And he said if the earth is properly fertilized, then he said the property germatized seed dropped into it needs only the rain and the sun and it bring it forth. Is that what he said? That is what he said. And I'm using my own vernacular because that's the way I teach. Old time. Now that's New Jerusalem. To bring us forth good tidings. Bring you that. Get thee up into the high mountain, old Jerusalem. To bring us good tidings. Lift up thy voice for strength. <clears throat> Lift it up and let it not be afraid. Send the cities of Judah. Behold your God. <clears throat> oh, what did you hear? Did we not? Even the camera caught it. Saw the manifestation. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. And behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. Now, we saw that in, in, in the first Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 20, starting with the presence. Now, watch. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. Now, what do the people said in Brother Brown's message? And I just heard another guy telling me, this fellow preaches, he preaches three to six hour sermons. He's out west of us. And he's ranting and raving again. The pastor will see you through. The word pastor is a shepherd. Well, let's talk of the good shepherd. Here's the good shepherd. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd, because he is. He shall gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are young. This is why Lee Vale is not a genuine pastor. I do not have 
these attributes as I should have them to be 100% pastor. But I do pastor with a modicum of success and a little bit of it. That is why I always talk to you people. You must have a pastor. And you will have a pastor by the grace of God. And that pastor will not hoodwink you. Will not say, you listen to me and I got it, I'll see you through. And live not just corny, but live foul that. Now you think, Brother Ben, if you've got a controversy, I have a controversy. If you haven't found out by now, stick around. Stick around. I have a controversy. I have a controversy with myself over this. Shall I then stand by and see those who are right, right roughshod over God's people and make a heyday <coughs> and dedicate and everything else? Not me. So I want to bring to your attention, I'm closing because I'll get back later on. Yeah. What's holding the church up? A five-fold ministry, number one. That neither preaches and teaches the true doctrine or lives it. Now the people are like the pastors. You said, Brother Bill, we're going to get rid of you. I wouldn't blame you at all. There's only one person I don't like getting rid of, that's Brother Branham. I saw his caliber, I saw his stature. My own sister, who is a handwriting expert, said this man is most peculiar. There is absolutely no deceit in his handwriting. And she said, my, how strange is he can lock everybody out and just get right along completely by himself, just can close the door. She saw a prophet and the character of a prophet in the handwriting. What could a truly spiritual-minded Christian see in a true prophet? I'm going to tell you something. I say, Brother, what have you been doing in that situation? I pray every day about my condition. I pray about yours. You pray about me. Together we're going on. Because I don't care how black and how dark it looks, there is a bride that has a five-fold <coughs> ministry that is based on the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ in its own position and order and can bring forth and help the people to mature and be one in the Lord and make that ranger. Amen. Now God's guarantee. I'm happy I know some people that I believe <coughs> positively are part of that throng. By the grace of God I count myself a part in all humility. It's a matter of grace. It's a matter of God's own honor. In other words, he honored us. We didn't ask for it. Nobody seeks it. Nobody asks to come to God. God opens the door and makes a way revelation and invitation. But there's a bride that's going to grow, brother, sister. And I'm looking for growth. I can't help but look for that growth. So the Lord bless you. Just want everything that crosses my mind, I want to help you to bring you up to date. And let you know, even if I emphasize over and over again, these conditions... And what we're looking for, we are looking to get out of here. And as we do, and we see all these things increase around us, look up and rejoice for your redemption is off now. Though I say some things that may bring us sadness of heart, and would maybe, if we let it go too far, go to a place of frustration, it isn't meant to be that way. It's meant to be looked at in the light of the Scripture, and in the light of the Scripture, being able to discern. And with the discerning, keep moving on and on. Because, listen, Somebody's going to get out of here. Look, somebody's got to get out of here. Somebody's got to get out of here. Why not, why not let it be you and me get out of here? We're the ones that are believing this word, and by the grace of God, we're going to do it. Sing us a song.
shall we pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we welcome your presence with us this morning, Lord, only hoping somehow that it's not rubbing off on us, but actually indwelling us, O God, by the Holy Ghost within us. We might bring forth fruit, Lord, in your word under the praise, the glory, your grace. We might testify that we are the written epistles of God himself. Lord, we don't want this on our own. We, we are very fearful that this would be the case. But, Father, we know you're a good God. You love us, and we believe that somehow we are directly related to you by the, by the birth and the rebirth, Lord. And we just pray that you'll help us then to assume the position responsibility you've given us. Bless each one in divine presence. May not one go away empty. May there not be one here, but receives what that person came for, and even more so, even as it's always been in your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. And before we start to read on page 42, paragraph 192, we take note that the cleansing of the heavens and earth, preparatory for the descent of the new Jerusalem on Mount Zion, is a cleansing like no other cleansing that has been or ever will be. Now, there'll be no need for any more after this one. Now, since Peter mentions the flood as destroying the world of the ungodly, and sets it forth as an illustration of the cleansing of fire which is about to come, we'd like to compare the two and see wherein they actually differ. Now, the first cleansing by destruction was first of all judged and then destroyed, was merely a washing of the atmosphere by water, and the same water washing the earth's surface changed the earth through forming oceans and seas, and the earth tilted on its axis, and land masses were no doubt co covered by great deposits of silt, layers of good earth, <coughs> at least in many, if not all, places. We have no understanding that all the places were covered by the good earth and silt, though it's quite possible that did take place. Furthermore, eight people only, and all animals, and birds were carried over in their same condition of perversion. Remember, just one person came over, and that was uh, Noah, the only perfect man genetically. And uh, his wife, of course, was not. Therefore, the sons and their wives were not. And therefore, he stood as one person genetically perfect, typing, of course, today. Just before the fire, the one person to stand genetically perfect is God himself in our midst. There's nobody else. So there was only eight people, and all animals and birds were carried over in their same state of conversion. <clears throat> and they were left to start in you with the same government and the same problems on the earth, because uh, that's all they had was those same problems. And since that time, all creation, including all creatures, have progressively deteriorated, as has all systems of government, got worse and worse in every form. But in the cleansing by fire, we notice that the atmosphere shall catch fire and literally melt, as will also the crust of the earth. Absolutely nothing except uh, creatures will go into the, uh, rather nothing except changed creatures shall go into the changed earth. There'll be no one going in his present status. There will be an entirely new form of government and a new orderly system. In other words, there will be a government that will definitely <clears throat> be a government of status, starting with the top, which is God himself, pillar fire, down through Jesus, no doubt 12 apostles, 12 patriarchs, whatever, down, 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 to the foundation ones of the bride, then outflowing out into the uh, world beyond it, the earth beyond it, the kings, and there'll be a status uh, out there, be, out there too. <clears throat> now, again, we say absolutely nothing except changed creatures go into the changed earth. There'll be an entirely new form of government, a new system of order. This will be far greater than the millennium, for in the firstborn of the first resurrection from among the dead, go into a renovated land for one thousand years. There they will build farms and have homes, or they'll have homes and, bu and uh, they'll build homes and actually farm the land, is what the Bible teaches. <clears throat> there Satan is bound 1,000 years by a chain of circumstances, but at the end of the millennium, the 1,000 years, all the rest of the dead come forth 
and we see sin appear once again because the devil comes up on all his crowd and all the sinners that didn't want God anyway still don't want God. In fact, at that time, at the end of the thousand years, at the white throne judgment, the second resurrection, sin is so virulent, it's so strong and so terrible, that Satan and all the wicked attempt to attack God and his people and seize the kingdom, which they do. They don't get anywhere with it. But fire comes down out of heaven, and Christ and his own are hidden <coughs> and caught away, Brother Branson, up into the heavens. Maybe the heaven heavens. Until we're placed in a city of pure gold, transparent, where we do not build homes or labor because God has already prepared it and our way of life will be just for the taking of it. At that great fire and lake of fire, all things that offend are annihilated. Now, you just figure what things bother you now and you'll know they're going to be gone. You say, well, I don't think that needs to be because I'm going to be changed. Well, you don't know God. You know, everybody wants to sell God short by his own idea. So, well, I see, if I'm immortal, I don't care if this mosquito's going to bite. Goodbye to the mosquitoes. So, well, I don't think the thorn will rip my flesh. It certainly won't, because there'll be no thorns there. Hallelujah. In other words, I want what God wants, and that's the best. And we can never outwant God when it comes to the real good things. So, all right, all things that offend are annihilated. From Satan on down, it is all destroyed, annihilated. From that time, we are dwelling with God as a redeemed people in a redeemed heaven and earth, and all creation and all creatures are delivered, redeemed forever and ever, and walk in harmony with God and in his light and in his glory and his government <coughs> through the headship of the Son upon the throne will never decrease but rather increase and without an end. The earth and the firmament and all creation in it will radiate with the brightness and the glory and the life of God. Now that's what we're looking at. <clears throat> okay, let's start reading in our books. Page 42, 192. Now if you got the right ones, they're what Brother Marmel has put out. Uh, the other ones be a bit of a problem maybe. God and his creation, 192, and his creatures of this creation are redeemed by God's own blood. Now, you see, right away people are a little bit too holy for God. <clears throat> they have a little higher morals and ideals. Well, now, I don't think the blood was needed for creatures in creation, just us. You've got to be whistling in the dark. You don't know where you're going. Let it sink in. I want you to show me one place where God ever made anything and deemed it unworthy. In the Bible it tells us he created all these things and absolutely <clears throat> they were in a perfect divine order. And that's what you're looking for God to redeem and it took the blood to do it. See, what we're looking at with Brother Branham is back to an integration. We have become disoriented concerning God and the things of God and what God wanted. See, we're very disoriented. We can't, that's our trouble. We can't seem to blend together, integrate within ourselves and with uh, each other and with God. <clears throat> Look, you're sitting here. I don't know when you might knife me. When I might cut your throat. I'm just bringing these things out, see. I might jip you, might jip me. Now we've got nice faith in each other, but I'm just trying to illustrate. Hey, kids, we haven't gone very far. The communists try to love each other. Love my foot is just another rotten society. <clears throat> Politics and power. Where is trust? Well, hopefully we don't have too much of it. Somebody will cut your throat if you do. Look at God's creation. The lamb will lie down with the lion. There will be no killer instincts. See? Now, what Brother Branham tries to show us here is the beautiful future 
we're walking into, it started now. See? Desperately, we want to love and trust each other. <clears throat> Hungrily, we make advances, only to know that many times the outstretched hand will be cut off. Or like feeding a morsel of bread to the dog, he wants more than the bread, he wants your five fingers. And yet we're desperately trying. So don't you see what Brother Branham is saying here? The blood does it. Let's sit here this morning and ask a question. Let's say, all right, hey, <clears throat> we come back as glorified people. We come back on an earth that isn't in 100% harmony. You got a battle. You're still fighting. And I ask you a question. Can you and I do anything that will restore the harmony? And the answer is no. I'm going to, I said, a cactus here. Now, a little cactus. Now, you just don't dare hurt me. Oh, man. We say, you're glorified. Does that mean I'm going to go around testing everything under God's high heavens? You're glorified in that? You've got to be ridiculous. I don't care what you and I do. <clears throat> it's the blood that does it. The blood shed upon the earth. <clears throat> the blood shed for every ounce of God's creation. And remember, the Holy Ghost is the burning fire, as it were, that comes and burns it all out, bringing back all the good. Without the blood, it couldn't be. So I want you to make your minds go beyond what we have been taught <coughs> by previous generations, thinking that we're really wonderful citizens of the kingdom and very loving toward God to say, Lord, your blood shouldn't drop upon the earth by the old earth, you know. A news for you. Without the blood shedding, shed and dropping on the earth, you would not come back to this earth and to New Jerusalem, make up your mind. You see how important doctrine is? You say, well, brother, it really wouldn't make any difference if we didn't know that. I don't know that you're right when you say something like that. Because Brother Branham claims this sermon is by divine revelation. <clears throat> Under the seventh seal, that you might know and this is a part, as far as I am concerned, what we have to know. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, 17, that the God of our Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance of saints. <clears throat> in other words, you are stepping up to the divine plan of God, which William Branham is revealing. And without it, you don't make it. Amen. Now, you want to go home now? You want to continue? Because I'd be glad to dismiss you. I'm tired already. Because this, this is what it means. Hey, do you believe it or don't you believe it? <clears throat> See? In other words, for the first time, you're getting a true worldwide revelation of true redemption, not foolish, hypocritical restoration, so-called, where one day the devil and Jesus will walk down the streets of glory hand in hand. That's a lie from the pit of hell. That's the same junk that Jimmy Jones had, and look what the beautiful city they had, <clears throat> what happened to them. So your doctrine does make a difference. Now, there's something in here I'm not trying to explain, I'm not trying to find. I just know if I believe it, it's going to do something for me. It's going to bring the dead out of the ground. It's going to put me in a resurrection with them and get out of here. Revelation, the shout is terribly important. <clears throat> now, he said here, and that's just one sentence, 
one part, half of part of part of sense. God, God in His creation, <coughs> it should be God's creation, not God in His creation, because God doesn't get cleansed; He sheds His blood. God's creation and His creatures of this creation are redeemed by God's own blood, cleansed by His own cleansing process, His germ killing, sin killing process, like as if anything is sterilized. The best sterilization we've ever had has been fire. You can, you can take anything and wash it with soap suds and all these chemicals they talk about. It still isn't free. But you burn it once. And when the holy fire of God sterilizes the earth, and when the chemicals are all changed back, and he's lifted his bride, which can come into heaven with him while this is going on, and comes back upon the earth again, there'll be new heavens and a new earth which are undefiled. <clears throat> now, you know that Brother Brown is speaking very truthfully the fact it takes fire to kill some germs. Now, freezing doesn't kill virus. <coughs> it takes fire to really get rid of them. Now, I don't know too much about the ages, glacial and everything else. And I haven't got a clue as to whether this is the truth, that it was the, the uh, <coughs> deluge that destroyed the mastodons. But it is said the sudden descent of like that mass of water just shoom, took away the heat so fast that the mastodon was positively frozen. And he's still frozen. They still find him in the, in the steppes of Russia. And dig him out and they say he could actually cook a steak. Now the point is I'm trying to show you, water, if that's the case, doesn't do it. Frost doesn't do it. <clears throat> it's going to be fire that does it. And every germ is going to be destroyed. It's got to go. Everything that's, that's not good for us, <clears throat> it's all going to go. And all nature is going to be changed back to where it should be, and that's original nature. Now notice, now Brother Branham says concerning the new heavens and new earth upon which in New Jerusalem, number 93, 193, the cold winter can't hurt it, the hot summers can't hurt it, the desert of blossom like as it rose, sin and sinners are gone. Well, that that's, might say, well, that, that person saying that doesn't have much grace. I don't tell it takes a lot of grace to say that. There's a lot of, we got a lot of sinner friends, nice people. <clears throat> We're not here to chop anybody to pieces. But I'm going to tell you something. If they get in, way of the, in the way of the sword, I, I look at it. I'm sorry, it's not my fault. So the sin and the sinners are all gone. See? <clears throat> God in his creatures and creation is dwelling together in perfect harmony. <clears throat> now, you know something? I'm glad all these chemicals are finally going to be put back in their place, which is not in your bodies and mine. The doctors <clears throat> and the lawyers and the government know only one thing. That is to take a small segment of society and endow them with the complete grace of authority to do what they want, if it means killing you and me. Right? Be honest, it's the truth. <clears throat> Doctors have a license to kill. Now, if you don't think that's the truth, how come out there in California when they didn't have a doctor on the job for five days, nobody died? The minute they came back, they all started dying like flies again. I'm not against doctors, I'm just trying to bring a point to you. Chemicals are fine, but they don't necessarily belong in your body. Now, Brother Branagh said doctors are of God, and to the extent we know that if they're well-trained and conscientious and do the patient no harm, which is the number one vow, which how many keep? I don't know. Maybe they try more than I think they do. <clears throat> all right. You give them so much poison, and you balance with an antidote. Well, I know when I took Nizerol, Nizerol is definitely a poison, but it did kill the buggies in me. But I know one thing, the doctor did not give me an antidote. The thing had to wear itself out, and my body then had to build itself up. And as Brother Brown had explained that, he said penicillin will kill the rats, but what, mends, what plugs the rat holes or mends the rat holes? <clears throat> There's got to be a life there. Now what I'm looking at is this. There is an attempt at a new line of medicine which our government will not allow because of the drug and the doctor combine. 
and they cannot make a proper decision. The prophet said so. No politician can make a right decision. He can't do it. The Speaker of the House, Jim Wright, had written into a bill to let a woman get off with $4 million taxes by just simply saying a certain beneficence or a certain foundation <coughs> which deals in charities, uh, if, if dying and on a certain date, <coughs> the estate would not be taxed. Well, that's that woman's husband. <coughs> so they phoned and said, what about it? She said, all I know is that it could be I won't have to pay all those taxes. Too bad Jim Rice not a friend of everybody. Rostenkowski, the same thing. Who needs him? Read your papers. It's full of it. He, <coughs> the editors are angry. The economists are angry. But the poor, dumb people aren't angry because they're hoping Mr. Rostenkowski and Mr. Speaker Jim Wright will somehow do them a favor. See how rotten everything is? Everywhere. You haven't got a clue. Now, I'm going to tell you something. <coughs> you deal with certain doctors of the natural medicine of life, which is the herbs of the field, the fruit that's supposed to be like the leaves for the healing. God's Word tells you <clears throat> what is good for you, if we could only get it, I suppose. But you know, they'll even tell you, which is the truth, there is nothing that doesn't vibrate. This bit of metal here is vibrating. And you can get an instrument that can measure the vibrations in the movement. You can pick up a rock that sits on the hill, and with the wind didn't blow or anything else except for minor erosion, the rock could sit there for 20 million years, but it's still moving. There's a vibration, and everything in nature is in tune. And some of these men have found out. I don't know who they listen to. Maybe some voice out there that wasn't God. Maybe it was God's voice, I don't know. But they can tell you even at a distance whether you are in tune and in harmony within yourself and your body, and they are quacks to the chemical industry. I'll be glad when the chemicals are in divine order. <clears throat> They'll never be out of, out of divine order again. You won't get a splinter in your hand. No dog will up and bite you. No snake will have venom. You say, that sounds like a case of blanc mange. You know, pudding. Creamy texture. Cream puff existence. Exactly. Exactly. Secretly, every man has not really wanted to be macho man and every woman, whatever she is. Secretly, everybody has wanted to be real, but they've been misled. And this is the only true reality. We've never had it, except when we were in an embryonic form. Pardon me, it goes past, beyond that, a seed form in Christ. And we're waiting to get where God wants us to be. But how many people will listen to a prophet of God who knows where God wants us to be and we're going to be. See, our own thinking, <clears throat> because of religious prejudices, it's a good word, instead of real theology, takes us away from reality. <clears throat> it does. See, I mentioned this morning reading scripture, the ungodly. Who's that? That's Cain and his bunch. They won't take the truth. Now, perfect harmony. Now watch the harmony. As the heavens and earth are husband and wife, so is Christ and the church. <clears throat> in other words, we are looking for a harmony in the universe which is contingent, not only contingent with Christ, but actually emanates and is a product of the Christ. <clears throat> Unity. Now, Man doesn't know harmony, but he's going to. That's for sure. And it's going to be the harmony which is epitomized <clears throat> by a marriage, a union, as God wanted it. <clears throat> How did God want his marriage? He said, this man needs a helpmeet. And of course, 
All the fat ladies and men, they make a joke and said, God didn't say, I'm going to give them a help eat. Give them a help meet. And then they turn around and they say, this help meet means helps and meets conditions, helps and meet problems, <coughs> helps and meet life. And I got news for you. That isn't true either. The actual fact of the matter is help meet means one like him in his own order. Now, let's say that the bride <coughs> is in the order of Jesus Christ. She's one with him because she's one of him. Her thoughts are his thinking. Not his commands, <coughs> although they were commands, and hey, you do this. You know, how would you like to see two people, let's say one-armed paper hangers, work together? And they had opposite arms off just to make it really good. You say, no, 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 I just don't know that they could do too good a job. That's what I'm talking about in marriage. <clears throat> it's not one person in an authority or a headship <clears throat> or two people contemplating coming to some end whereby they somehow get together on plans, but it is one thought. How would you like to have now a paper hanger, two of them with two hands? I'm going to pick up, put down, pick up, and they go, hey, those guys are working like clockwork. Do you ever see anything like it? Yeah, you'd almost think they had one mic. Yeah, and almost one arm. That's marriage. The way God said it. She <coughs> is one of my kind. <coughs> now, in marriage with Adam and with Eve, remember they had God over them. And they were in a position of what? Trial. They were, they were there <clears throat> on not probation, but something like that. You know what I mean? But when we're talking of this now, that is not so. Because Brother Branham in this message tells us that this marriage, the lamb is on the throne and the pillar of fire is above the throne, but they're one. And before they call, he answers. Or just a minute. That doesn't make sense. Or does it? No, it doesn't make sense unless you bring it into sense, which means that God has anticipated every single thing so that you, as the anticipator, in your anticipations, have only the anticipations that he put within you. And it's a never-ending but ever-flowing life. God made Eve basically to be that. And he made a bride to be that. Listen, what is driving people buggy? Think, think, think. Think, think, think. Think, think, think. Think what? Well, let me see. How can I get this guy? He might get me. What's that do? What's going to do? Scratch, scratch, scratch. You, you know what I mean? <clears throat> the thoughts of man that come from the heart are desperately wicked. Now, brother, sister, I am talking over 1,000 years down the road with the prophet. But I want you to know that is what marriage was supposed to be. And it's going to be. <clears throat> the heavens and earth anticipate each other, not just complement each other, although that is true. But there is one life, Christ and his bride, as one. Now, I know that's beyond this, but I'm going to tell you something. I don't care if it is. I want it. I would just like to see nature back in the hands of God with the comets and the planets and the stars spinning up there 24,000 miles a minute or whatever it is. Never hitting. Choo, choo. That, well, how many went by when I said choo? How many just missed each other? Never a miss. I mean a hit on, or as though there's a miss and they could hurt anybody. <clears throat> the great mind of God is going to take us there. And they all meet, now watch, in one big glorious plan of redemption. In other words, 
every single thing that went askew, every single thing that's messed up, every single thing that's off track, every single thing is going to come into divine order. <clears throat> that's why Brother Branham said, if you get the wrong one here, you'll get the right one over there. And it won't be marriage as we know marriage. It's going to be this what I'm talking about. <clears throat> In other words, he explained it on one other tape. Most everybody, like for years and years, we could simply quote Brother Branham and said, one day I heard it on tape. And it's nothing but compatibility. Strict compatibility. In other words, there is a unity <clears throat> as it should be. They all meet in one great big glorious plan of redemption and is brought right into the bosom of God again. <clears throat> in other words, back to the first divine essential, which was thinking, wisdom, followed by the next divine essential, which was capability or omnipotence. <clears throat> so now, we go back to where God had it all figured out and the ability to do it, but this was thrown in to bring about the attributes of God in redemption. So now with redemption by the blood <clears throat> and the burning over of the atmospheres in the earth, God is recreating and bringing us to this position of back to the bosom. <clears throat> in other words, the heart of God. You can see this in Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, just exactly like himself. No spot, no wrinkle, none such thing, absolutely holy, the lamb without a blemish. Help me. <clears throat> Everything one. Now, we can't get this as husband and wife. We have a very poor type. But that's all types are, very poor. They never can approximate the real thing. They just look to it. <clears throat> all right, number, and you can't get to know this, of course, till we get there. Now, number 95, and in the new earth, there is a new city. Oh, my, now listen close. Don't forget this. And Jesus said in John 14, he would go to prepare it for us. Let not your house be troubled. He said that when he's going away. I have a reason to go away, he said. You believe in God? Well, then believe in me also. You see, they couldn't see he was God. He said, you believe in God? Sure you do. Now you believe in me. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions. Or, as is literally written, in my Father's kingdom are many palaces. Christ is there under promise of the construction of the new Jerusalem now. In other words, he is there, and the promise is he is making it right now. Now listen close. Don't move. Don't miss this. Christ is in heaven today preparing the new Jerusalem. <clears throat> Just as God created the earth in six, di six days, made the earth in six days, 6,000 years, he said, don't be ignorant. <clears throat> we do in Scripture 1,000 years is one day. Christ is gone and is preparing the place that's been on its construction for many, many thousands of years, preparing a place. And if I go and prepare a place, I'll come again, receive you, that wherever I am, there you may be also. Notice the Redeemer and the Redeemed. <clears throat> now, Brother Branham is telling us here, now he said, I don't want you to miss this. I want you to know one thing. Christ is doing this now. Let's look at some scripture just for the fun of it, <clears throat> for the joy of it. You know, I, 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 I kind of guess at some of these things, what he's got in mind. But this, this, this sermon, you see, is like the Bible in 20th century language. So when I read Brother Branham here, I think, well, now this man is a prophet of God, and he's giving us the word for this hour in our 20th century language and our knowledge for this hour in which we live. <clears throat> so I'm going to look in my mind and see if I can place it with the Scripture because it's in here. So I read little things like this if I can find it. Okay, I go to John 5 and 17. <clears throat> and he says here, um, but Jesus answered and said, My father worketh hitherto, <clears throat> up to this point, there's an interim coming on, or he won't, and I work. In other words, there's going to be a work stoppage of God, and I'm going to take over. Now let's read that in the light of 10 to 20. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, the man that took up his bed and walked in Sabbath, It is a Sabbath, there's not law for you to carry your bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said, Take up thy bed and walk. And if a man can make me whole, and he said, take up your bed and walk. Well, I, certainly I'd do it. What do you think? I'm some kind of a kook. He'd be scared not to. Well, he'd be overjoyed. Great. 
I could lift nothing yesterday. Lost me lift my bed today. <coughs> so, so he went. He didn't. <coughs> and um, he that was healed didn't know who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away. And a multitude being in the place, he just snuck out amongst the crowd. Afterward, Jesus finds him in the temple, the same man that he healed, and said, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come out of thee. And the man departed. He went straight to the Jews and said, Jesus is the one that made me whole. Oh, the Jews were mad. Therefore, the Jews pers did persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered and said, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then answered Jesus and said, Verily I send you unto him. The Son can do nothing of himself. <clears throat> but what he sees the Father do, that whatsoever things he doeth, these things also do the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and shows him all these things that, do, he, that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, <clears throat> that you may marvel. No, what I'm trying to show here is the fact that, that Jesus is up there doing a certain work, and this work is absolutely the work of Almighty God he's doing. <clears throat> he's doing according to plan and according to context, within the plan, exactly what is right. And he's building this marvelous, glorious city of pure, solid gold. <clears throat> now, Brother Branham says that this city has been in progress for thousands of years. Well, now that's very strange, but is it, it is strange. Let's go to the book of Hebrews, the 11th, the 11th chapter. And notice in verses 11, 8 to 11. By faith Abraham, when he's called to go to a place which he should after receive from inheritance of bait, and when he went out not knowing whether he went, by faith he sojourned the land of promise in the strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, and heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And I'm going to sit down when I get there. Ain't going to move no more. Okay. <clears throat> Let's read a little further. This time we go to chapter 12. <clears throat> now Abraham looking for the city, the same city that Jesus promised and John saw. <clears throat> okay, 12. Now we're going to read verses 22 to 29. But you are come to Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God. Aha! God's own city. The heavenly Jerusalem to an innumerable company of angels. Now that's our mother, the true new Jerusalem. To the general assembly in the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that you refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not who refused him that spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. And once more is promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. That's looking to, the, to what Peter spoke of. <clears throat> That's looking to New Jerusalem. And this word, yet once more, signified the removing of those things that are shaken in contradistinction to those things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. <clears throat> in other words, uh, what you see here that can be shaken as not contradicting those that are made. They are those things that are made in contradistinction to that which cannot be shaken. In other words, which comes by the creative power of God. Wherefore, seeing we, now watch, we receive a kingdom which cannot be moved. Now, that is not the millennium. Although that's sneaking up to it. That's an interim period. <clears throat> Let us have grace, whereby we may serve God, except we represent God be fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Now, that is Malachi. But it's also down the road a thousand years. <clears throat> so, you can see here, it was preparing many, many thousand years. And he said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you. That wherever I am, there you may be also. Notice, the Redeemer and the redeemed. Now, who and what did he redeem? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> i got to go back to page 41 if I can find it. <clears throat> All right. Paragraph 189, remember, the Bible said if that soul won't do as he said, he'll even destroy that soul. But you see, nice, he can't redeem it. He can't destroy himself and remain God. So if that soul is of the world, it has to be destroyed. Then what is your soul of? <clears throat> it's a part of God. So he's going to redeem it. Also, page 42, 192. And that's just the first sentence about. 
God and His creation, His creatures of this creation are redeemed by His own blood, cleansed by His own cleansing process, His own His germ killing, sin killing process, like as if anything is sterilized. <clears throat> okay, that's what's going to be redeemed. Just that which can stand the fire, like the Hebrew children. All right, 197. I wish we had time now. I got marked your psalm I'm quoting this girl, the bride. Oh, I just have to admit it's getting too late. See, I'll get at it some other time. One, when he tries to get to her, but she's engaged to a shepherd boy. Some probably thought that was a song that he sung. No, Solomon was on the throne. He inherited from David, but it was only an earthly throne. But this, but this did show that the kingdom had to pass away. What was this all about? It was a type of Christ in love with the bride, the Song of Solomon. Notice that Jesus said, John 14 now, going to prepare a place. Oh, what will it look like? Did you ever think now, bride? Brother Brandon said, I don't call you a church anymore. I call you bride. Bride. He's going to describe the city. What will it look like? It is prepared and designed by the divine architect. What will that city look like? Now, I'm going to talk about it for a few minutes. <clears throat> the divine architect has designed it and prepared it. I put designed before prepared because I'm thinking in terms of a blueprint and then working from the blueprint. And look, he's designed and prepared it with tender hands for his beloved bride. Now, let's watch something here. You go to the scripture, and you're going to find that Job said that God will desire to see the work of his hands. And over in the book of Genesis, God himself with his own hands molded man's body from the dust. Man was created. <clears throat> man was formed. See? So now he takes this very thing, and his own hands, whereby he made man, he is doing this for us now out of the silver and gold. <clears throat> now, if you just recall that the Spirit of God fell upon Bezalel and the various workers who were workers or artificers in gold and silver and brass to make the tabernacle of the wilderness. Then he endowed men at the time of Solomon that they could cut material and just bring it together. And you didn't hear a sound of a hammer and nail, just shoved it together. <clears throat> perfect acoustics, perfect everything. I, sometimes you read articles that just literally blind you, your thoughts. How could they do it? You see, God did it. So this same God is doing this for you and me. Exactly what he had in his mind, he is carrying out himself. Because if his little, rem, little, little dollop of the Holy Ghost in the mind of a person <clears throat> could make him a creator with his hands, marvelous artificer, what could God himself do? God can do anything he puts his mind to. Well, God's got a mind to do this, and he's going to do it. <clears throat> What's it going to look like? <clears throat> now, listen to what he says. Could you imagine how a capable man in marrying his wife builds and puts every little thing just exactly to her touch? or just how she'd like it. <clears throat> he said, Amen. <clears throat> now, uh, that tells you something here, that evidently the bride has a knowledge deep in her that she really wants to see fulfilled. In other words, she's got designs. She's got something she wants that she really would like to have God do for her. See? So God is going to do it for her. Just like a husband. <clears throat> the woman comes in and she said, well, I would like this and this and this. Now, our house is a little different, i got to admit. Uh, I never asked my wife exactly what she wanted. I just gave it to her knowing that she'd like it. Because everything I planned in the house was essentially for her to the extent today I've got to build another house where I can have a place in it because the office is no good, <clears throat> but she'll get everything she wants or everything she doesn't want. Then, of course, she doesn't want all want. <clears throat> it's quite a, quite a different thing. But most... Go ahead, turn door. <clears throat> Here again, you find that as the woman was the help meet, the exact uh, likeness of the man, in every sensibility, she'd be just like him, innately, you know, a real part. So this woman, <clears throat> the bride, will have thoughts from God, and God will bring those thoughts to pass. And what is beyond her thinking, because she is in 
the flesh at this point, God will so make it that she'll say, hey, this is exactly what I want all the time. In other words, you're recognizing <clears throat> what God is doing. All right. Now, that's a beautiful thing here, this marriage. Now, for 201. Now the divine architect has designed a new city where he will live with his bride exactly as she wants it, just to her touch. No wonder the apostle said, I has not seen, ear, heard, neither in the heart of man what God's prepared. Let's see if we can probe into it just for a moment and see what it's going to be like or look like. <clears throat> and uh, we're building the church the same way to get rid of this place where you've got an air condition and nothing works. So uh, let's get out of here in a hurry. <clears throat> get to this city too. You know, one fellow said this big, the, the men's, men's going to be like, he said, it's going to be like a big plastic bubble, air conditioned. I said, hogwash. I think his ha head was air conditioned. <clears throat> <laughs> My Lord, have pity. <clears throat> oh, what a place it must be. Now watch. When divine nature, a divine architect, has designed it for a divine attribute that's been divinely predestinated by a divine God, who is the author of divine life. Now, the word divine means of God, so that's kind of like a redundancy here. <clears throat> but we're going to look at it. And I'm going to tell you what I think as I read this, what Brother Branham had in mind, because the man was a poet, <clears throat> though I'm not. He's a deep thinker, though I'm not. But I can come up with some of his thoughts without a doubt, because I got the same God, and I got the same Bible, and I got a little ministry to help out with it, because I'll explain this to a degree. What a place it must be when you consider number one <clears throat> there is a divine nature within the divine architect. Now, what would be a divine nature? A divine nature would be this, a true revelation of his true character, what he's really like. <clears throat> In other words, what this God is really like down inside, what he really intends, what he really wants for you and me and for himself. And what he's really going to do is going to come out of what's exactly inside of him. <clears throat> now, a divine architect means that he is going to think it over, design it, and bring it to pass exactly <clears throat> with what is within him. <clears throat> now, look, I ask you a question as human beings. In the light of what Brother Brown has taught us, the scripture says about the city, I want to ask you something. Tell me one thing that's missing that you'd like to throw in here. Cigarettes? No. Bottle of booze? No. Crack? <clears throat> you want even STP to make your motor run. <clears throat> what, what, what would you add to this? Now, listen, this may shock our systems, but we're going to get this. This should make everybody grin, a big happy grin. Because this is in process, and we know we're going to get it because we believe in vindication. <clears throat> the world doesn't. See, there's got to be something to narrow it down. The man that jumps the highest, <clears throat> I haven't got a prayer. I never was a high jumper. I can't even jump. I stumble over cigarette paper. You know how these guys, they lift one leg and then bring the body over? Now they throw themselves over. Thank you for the support. What the, it's the big throw I get to. That's how I can jump. You, if it's a, some feat of strength, forget it. I have got arthritis muscle trouble right here. Well, maybe lifting. I'm sorry my back ain't what it used to be. Never was good enough anyway. My God, I used to work as a kid to build up muscle. Let me show you what. I can't, look at I weigh too much now, but look at those arms. They're, those arms are nothing but real bone. I can't put muscle on them. I used to take buckets of rocks, put my wrist like this, and take a six, 40, 60 pounds of rocks, do it 100 times. Take my fingers 100 times. Never could put anything on there that looked like a man. <laughs> so you think, so it's going to be something like this? The machos are out. Forget it. <clears throat> No, oh, it's nothing that we are ever going to produce that gets us in here. It is from the heart of God, and this lovely city, and this new creation is according to his nature. What's according to my nature? You ask my wife. 
She asked too many questions, I blast her. I can't stand questions. <coughs> she doesn't jump fast enough when she passed the stage of jumping. I get angry there, too. What's, what's your nature? Let's be honest now. I'm just mentioning the mild things. Never mind the tough ones. <coughs> what comes out of your hearts? Bill's a nice boy. The rest of you guys didn't say anything, but Bill speaks for all of you. <coughs> Ask your wife, ask your husband, ask your kids what comes out. Ask the neighbors. Ask your banker, ask your lawyer, ask your doctor. Just ask your girlfriend. Anything. Boyfriend, who knows? <clears throat> See? This comes out of God. This is his nature to do this. This is, this is just God to do it. See? Does a cat like cream? 